Hey folks, it's Friday at six and it's the Gardener's Workshop Live coming to you here from the farm with a check-in and um, it looks like it's getting ready to blow a little something outside for a minute. So I thought I would do what I was gonna do at the end at the beginning. So welcome. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler and if we haven't met before, um, I am a small cut flower grower here in southeastern Virginia, growing literally in the middle of the city, and um, just coming to you each Friday here, sharing what's going on on the farm, and that's really what I'm talking about today. So, what um, one of the things that we do here on Fridays, all through the season, all through spring and summer, and right up until just a few weeks ago, is we start sunflower seeds together. I plant mine and many people follow along and plant theirs every week. And so I have some of them harvested today and I thought it would just be a great opportunity to take a look at some of the different colors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I, just a couple little things I wanted to show you. So first I wanted to show you this is the bunch of sunflowers that have been in on my kitchen table all week long. They'll still be good for at least another seven days or so, but y'all, how can you not be happy when this is on your kitchen table, right? Totally, completely beautiful. These are all pro cuts, and we're gonna look at um, some of the bunches here a little bit closer. So um, I wanna show you some of the ones that we, and all of these, we planted together, right? And we pretty much, yesterday I cut these that I'm getting ready to show you, and we're pretty much done now. We've had um, kind of torrential downpours all day long, and so what few sunflowers were still left out there, or I looked at them, they're kind of twisted. Um, and I wanna take that opportunity to say that we really haven't had much wind. Um, torrential downpours cause more flower damage than people give it credit for. And that's where flower support netting can just save your life. And our sunflowers should be netted, but we don't net them just because we plant so many so often. It's just something that we can't get to. But in a home garden and in a small garden situation, I totally recommend um, netting sunflowers. And um, if we're able to get out there to the garden, I'll show you the blown over ones. Um, and when, when support netting is installed properly, and I will tell you y'all, I see a lot of loose netting installed in people's gardens on social media. I just wanna call them up and say, you know, that's not how, I mean, it's like so loose, what's the point? Um, and people think it doesn't work and it works beautifully and it's safe when it's installed properly. So, um, and I love seeing all the sunflowers passing by. If you're one of our students and part of our Gardener's Workshop family of any of our courses, we just love for you to comment with the sunflower emoji. And that way everybody else knows you're one of our students and other students will recognize you and, and you guys can connect. So I have, um, First, we'll start off with the, the, the unexpected, I think. So these are, um, again, so I grow primarily pro cuts, um, and that is because they are the quickest from seed to bloom. They have, most of them have stiff necks. They're long lasting. Of course, their pollen list is what makes them to be long lasting cut flowers. Um, and this little baby right here has grown to be um, one of our top selling seed and flowers. Um, I mean, who doesn't want this in a bouquet? And look at the variation and the different sizes. We vary the size of our sunflowers by spacing, and that's one of the things we talk about each week when we're sowing sunflowers. And you can go back and watch any of those. They're all right on my Facebook farm page. Just go to videos. Um, so look at this guy. I mean, these look like Gerber daisies, right? I mean, and if you are a flower farmer making bouquets, you cannot go wrong with sunflowers. And sunflowers and fall are like, as I love to say, peanut butter and jelly, y'all. They just go together. Um, and if you have commercial customers, they absolutely do. They don't even think of these as sunflowers. They think of it as a whole different flower. So this is the Pro Cut 
gold, light gold, they call it. Um, and it's got the green center and it's got true gold petals. Um, and it's a beauty. It is, we definitely start these every week now. You know, we kind of change it up from week to week, but we keep one or two constants from week to week in variety selection. And this is one of our constants because it goes with anything, right? Um, and so this is the, this is just one of our all time favorites. And then this, you know, the color of the year is yellow, right? And that means that yellow is gonna be super popular for at least the next two to three years. And this is Pro Cut Lemon. And I love this lemon. This is just the best darn color, right? Um, the only thing I don't like about this is a lot of the heads are like this. Um, they're, they face flat up against the stem, meaning there aren't many on the top facing upwards, um, but they're definitely super usable. And we really, I mean, this is a favorite right here, right? Look how he's kind of facing up. Um, and so Pro Cut Lemon is another great one. And both of these colors that I just showed you are good year round. This particular color, Lemon, is the one that we start, as well as the Gold Light, they're the ones that we start really early in spring because they go so well with spring flowers. They aren't, um, they aren't like the classic, I don't even have a classic sunflower in here, right? Maybe there's one in here. You know, the classic orange with, um, with a dark center. They look like summer, right? Um, and when you've got cool flowers in the spring and you're looking for feature flowers, these sunflowers, this one and the Pro, um, Pro Cut Gold Light and Lemon are excellent along with the white ones, which I don't have any white ones right now. Um, both of those are great ones to think you know, that's part of our strategy with sunflowers is we're thinking, what season are these sunflowers blooming in, right? All right, so y'all, we gotta get off here. We got other things to do. So I got several other little things here I wanted to show you. Another sunflower that you've heard me talk about right much from time to time that we don't really grow for the bloom, we grow it as filler. And I'm gonna show you, so I have some, and I just can't wait to show you. So it's called Sunfill. And Sunfill comes in green or purple. And this is the purple, and it's not really purple, y'all. So, let me take this rubber band off. So the Sunfill green is another one that we grow every single week. <clears throat> I wanna show you the perfect stage that I love it in. This is what we grow it for. Y'all, this is like the perfect bouquet filler. And so that is super mature. This is immature. Think about, think how much space that takes up in a bouquet. And it adds foliage, texture, um, and it just fills out your bouquet. So here it is starting to develop, right? Then here it is as it begins to open up. But this is not what we grow it for, y'all. This is much, much later in its life. We grow it, here's a good one. We grow it for this. We grow it to put that in a bouquet. It almost looks like a succulent, right? And the most awesome things about it is that you can time these. You can do them every week so that you have extra bouquet filler. It just adds one more texture to your bouquets and fills them out. I mean, who doesn't want to just pop one of those? And no, you're not, you're not using it and thinking of it as your feature flower. This is like the background flower, and look how beautiful that is. And so this is what's called the purple. I do have a couple of green ones that are more mature, and the green ones literally just have green centers. That's the big difference. But when it's in its foliage stage like this, before the sepals have really opened up, it is really kind of lighter green, and it is an excellent bouquet filler. Um, so this was like my last chance to talk to y'all about or show you sunflowers. Um, the sun fills um, are the same timetable as pro cuts. They're like 55 to 60 days. So if we're starting four trays of sunflowers a week, it really depends. We used to start 12 
100 a week, 10, we would start 10 trays of 128s. You know, we would have one or two of the Sunfill, and then we would break it out amongst our others. So Sunfill is an undervalued. You want to use it before it opens. We do not grow it for those petals, y'all. It's the sepals. Those are the green folds that are around the bloom, and they are just excellent bouquet filler, and they last a long time. Um, and so that is probably my best tip is for you to write on your calendars right now that you need to get Sunfill green is what I recommend. The purple is all right, the darker ones we were just looking at, but the green ones are just lighter. What you soon learn if you're starting to make bouquets for markets or supermarkets or subscriptions or whatever is people like bright stuff and any dark flower. That's why we don't grow deep red zinnias or wine zinnias. They are beautiful, but they just make bouquets too dark. So we stick with the sunfill green and remember those light colors for spring sunflowers. And then here's one other really, oh, I did want to show you this. I wanted to compare. So this is how a regular sunflower looks. See how the petals are long and they're covering the face? And then this is what a sunfill looks like. And it just adds another component, y'all. It's just... Um, I'm really in love with them, and I wasn't in love with them until I grew them, and I saw how useful they are in bouquets. And then this is just one of our fall blooming. Um, this is, I'm not even sure which color this is. I think this might be bicolor, um, what they call bicolor. And this is how you definitely cut them, just as they're beginning to open. Um, but they are really, really, really beautiful. And you could sell thousands and thousands of stems of these in the fall. So that's what I wanted to tell you about sunflowers since it's like my last chance to really show you some. And um, I did want to show you this also. Check out my sweet pea babies that are 10 days old. These are sweet pea. This is high scent. You'll find them on our website. High, they're called high scent because they are like the most fragrant sweet peas. Um, that are just super easy to germinate. And I will tell you what our secret is that we didn't see. You can see the um, roots there on the bottom. Um, I did what Farmer Bailey recommend. You know, Bailey is quite a professional expert on growing sweet peas. And I listened to him talk about not putting them on a heat mat, not putting them in a germination to give them like 55 degrees. And that's exactly what it's been around here at night. So I literally, we sowed these seeds. They were not soaked, sowed them and set them out on our carport. And here we are 11 days in and they will be ready to plant by the end of this week. Um, sweet peas like it cooler than what most people imagine. Um, so that's why we always really wait to kind of start our sweet peas. Um, so I did want to say for folks that are still um, or haven't gotten it yet, I put the link on this Facebook feed. I don't know if I can post it again or not. I bet it's already gone. Um, to get the PDF from me that is, yeah, it won't let me. Um, the link's at the head. It's a PDF, and we're calling it All Things Cool Flowers. It's a PDF of about 10 or 15 different cool flower resources, webinars, articles, podcasts, kind of everything in one place. Um, so um, check that out and I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna come back and answer your questions um, as soon as I get through this. So the other thing that I just wanted to mention and I'm gonna take you off here and go outside is, you know, this is just a great time of the year. I'm gonna try not to cut y'all off. Um, so we're gonna walk out here. It's really kind of dark um, and it's dark. Oh my, what a beautiful sky. Let me turn you around. Um, the sky is really, really, so the Warwick River is over there beyond all those houses, just ignore them. So I wanted to take you out here, and if we get, if the Wi-Fi gets wanky, I have a new iPhone, the iPhone 13, and we, I am having some real glitches with it, y'all, as there always are, and if I lose you, I will try to come back, but our Wi-Fi should be super strong, 
So here is the cool flower garden. First, you can look over there. You can see the cover crop is just all laying down. Um, and all the sunflowers were right there. <laughs> and they're all laying down now. And you can see the water in our pathways. I mean, we've just had really torrential rain this afternoon. I am pretty sure. Huh? Maybe I can walk across here. Oop, I'm sinking. All right, we're going to have to stand from the edges. So, this is my direct seated beds. And I have not gotten down in here. And this is my most favorite job to do, y'all. Um, and I'm just going to pull some. Sorry, y'all. I'm having to look at what I'm doing and not the camera. Hang on just a minute. And I'll show you. So, these are Chinese forget-me-nots that are planted right here. So you can see how I've run my hoe through and taken out, you know, 80%, 85, 90% of the weeds. And then because the seedlings are so little, um, you know, I'll probably next week come in here and just go through, this is all hen bit. This is all Chinese forget-me-nots. And as we move down, um, this is saponaria. So port. Then we have all kinds of bachelor buttons planted, all the new colors that we have. We added three mixes that I have not planted in a long time. I'm really excited for them. The bi-colored bachelor buttons. Um, and then this is agrostema, it looks like. But look over there. Look at the, that's lysianthus. And so, you know, we're doing an experiment this year. We've, we've often planted in the fall. They're winter hardy here for sure. Um, but I am reap, I'm going to order and have the same exact varieties plant, um, delivered for our very early spring planting time. And then we're going to compare stem length, um, timing of when they bloom to see is there a benefit to fall planting or not. Um, I know that in the past when we were in high production, we always fall and very early spring planted Lizzie's. Um, <clears throat> so we could just have the maximum amount. Um, and they're doing super great here this year. And right there, y'all, I'm sorry, I can't step over there. That is Godisha. And the next bed over, oh my goodness, that bed right there, that is a bed full of status. And that was just planted yesterday. And they were kind of small, and they look blooming awesome. Um, I was looking at them yesterday as she was planting them, and I thought... Uh, I hope I haven't jumped the gun. I should have waited another week. But y'all, rain was coming. The temperatures are perfect. This has been like the most perfect cool flower year. This doesn't happen very often. Um, and then, so that bed is the status. The next bed is a Rudbeckia bed. And um, we're growing, I think, six or seven different Rudbeckias in the garden this year. And then the next bed is a direct seeded. Let's see if we can walk back here. Because these the ends of my garden have been worked to grow, to get grass back down, it's kind of mushy. Um, so let's see where I can. I'm trying to look where I'm walking. So that is giant poppy pods, um, snaps. A mix of different things right there. That's Billy Balls and Fever Few. And then we have more snaps over there. That is all clover. How beautiful is that clover? Um, and so I want to walk you back here to look at my delphiniums, my campanula. Um, you can see that the if you've been watching this cover crop, it was so tall and strong. Um, even the Billy Balls got whipped over. Torrential rain is far more damaging. I just filled my shoe with water, y'all. I stepped in a puddle. Um, so this is, look how gorgeous this clover is. There's buckwheat planted with the clover. That'll all be dead and gone here in no time. But look at that gorgeous clover. That is the whole understory of this buckwheat. So I'm just getting back here to the other garden, and if the Wi-Fi goes wanky when I'm going past this building, see there's Wi-Fi equipment there, Wi-Fi equipment over there, and then it's also on the other side of the building, and I just frankly wasn't gonna invest to have it to shoot back here, 
most of the time it carries me from one to the other, but sometimes we, we get lost. But look at these delphiniums and the campanula. So I bought, these were bought as plugs. Um, this particular delphinium, Pacific Giants, um, is pretty, it's not one of the easiest ones to start from seed. Um, they're a little bit more difficult, and so I've always bought them from plugs. That's what's planted here. And then this is Campanula Champion, and that too is just, they just aren't as easy to start from seeds. And frankly, y'all, when you become a professional grower, it's like, you have better things to spend your time on, and I need a sure bet. Um, so there are some things that I bought plugs for. wasn't very many, but these were definitely two of them. And you can see we still have water in these horrible pathways. I just am not a fan of landscape fabric, y'all. And I'm always reminded every time I come back here and there's not vegetation to help cover it. Um, and I don't know if you can tell way down here. Okay, I don't want to walk in that water. Um, this bed, can't tell here, a rabbit got in. This is another bed of giant poppy pods. See, we grow the seed for that. So we produce a lot of giant poppy pods because we always sell out. Um, and then you can see our tuberoses are still growing. Those are our peonies, which will be cut down here shortly. Um, and then, you know, we throw away the peony foliage. Peony blight is a real threat, and it develop, or you can harbor it in the foliage. So we just leave like a six inch stump of stem sticking out of the ground, and um, then cut the foliage, and it literally goes in the trash can. You don't put it in your compost heap. Um, I was so happy that when Dave Dowling was here last year, um, this past summer, we were able to have an open farm. Um, oh my gosh, it was so wonderful to see people. And anyway, I was kind of nervous having Dave here with me. You know, he's such a professional. He could not find any peony blight in our peonies. Um, and part of that is because of our attention to tidying up our peony patch. And, um, we get over... Um, a thousand stems of peonies from this um, patch. And so I am going to walk back inside now and hopefully I will not lose you. There's our shade garden that has the Lenten roses and I'll look at your questions. Um, but this is the time of year that you should be planting, as you can tell from us, we have pots here, um, planting trees and shrubs and um, dividing perennials and um, all of those things that benefit from fall division and planting because one of the things that people don't really think about is planting trees and shrubs in the spring is like the worst thing you can do. You're planting a plant um, and then not long after you get it in the ground, it needs to start growing, facing heat, facing humidity and pests and disease, and perhaps blooming, making pods, whatever. And it's not even established. When you plant them in the fall, they have months to get well rooted in so they can face that. And in talking to tree people and to plant people, they say over the long haul, those plants planted in fall just have such a healthier outlook um, and survive so much longer. Um, so I wanted to mention that. I told you about the peonies. Um, and I did already say, and I'm gonna look at for questions now, um, that this is a great year for cool flowers. I mean, we don't normally get um, frost until usually like mid-November, um, and it's looking like whether, I don't know whether that'll happen or not, um, and so if we were still producing commercially, oh my gosh, we could have probably be selling right up to Thanksgiving, even from the field. So friends, let's see what you got. Tina here, lovely. Well, you've convinced me to plant suns in the midst of summer. I started paid for courses. You know what? You know what Dave Downing and I all what Dave Downing and I always say to people. It's like people are always wanting to know what else should I plant and what else can I do to build my business? If you are not planting sunflowers 
every single week from about a month before your last frost right up until about four or five weeks ago, um, you're missing out on the boat. Um, literally, Weekly Sunflowers bought me a $31,000 John Deere tractor in one year. Um, I couldn't have done that rotation without that tractor and tiller, but it was being able to plant those 1,200 sunflowers a week and selling them all, always did, for 26 weeks, y'all, you can do the math. Um, wholesale's like a dollar and 35 cents or something. Um, and, I mean, people, we all tend to make things so much more complicated than they need to be. Things are so simple, y'all, it's usually right in front of us. We just fail to reach up and pluck it. Because that's really how organic gardening is, right? I mean, it is so blooming simple. People just miss it. They're sure it takes so much more um, information. So, Rachel, I am so glad you're in flower farming school. So, for those of you that um, are in school, I can't wait for you to get your first class on, I think it's at Tuesday morning. And then we have our first coaching call um, or a coaching Zoom a week from Monday. And I'm totally exhausted, but you have to remember that we eat the ugly frog first. That's part of my motto is that we get the worst stuff out of the way and that's the business stuff. Um, so you're gonna get overwhelmed in the first weeks, but it's all about the business and then we're gonna do it and move on. I have your book, Cool Flowers, and I grew White Knight Pro Cups flowers because of you. Oh, Ruth, that's nice, thank you. I hope they went, hope it went well for you. All right, I'm looking here. Amy, how do I say yella? Yeller. <laughs> you don't realize how you say things so differently until you get around people in other areas, you know? I mean, I totally understand that. So I saw a question here. I worked I worked on sweet peas like you suggested. They, they did not have any scent. What type do you recommend? So there are, um, there's, we grow annual sweet peas, um, and there are there is a perennial, or actually there's two or three varieties of perennials um, that come back year after year, and they have no scent. They do not hold up very well, but they're great foliage, but they do not have scent. So you can find the ones that I love on my website, thegardenersworkshop.com. Go to the Cool Season Seeds. We have two varieties, high scent, which is I mean, it is the most, it is delightful. I mean, you just need like five or six little stems in your house and oh my goodness, they're amazing. Um, so it's high scent and there's royal mix. High scent is white with a blush, a brush of purple on them. Um, and then the royal mix is a bunch of different colors and they are just totally amazing. Um, so Janet asks, have you tried direct seeding sweet peas? I had almost 100% germination direct seeding. Um, we don't direct seed anything we don't absolutely have to for a variety of reasons. Um, first off, it's just more labor intensive because of weed pressure that we have. Um, and we have cutworms and then slugs are also a problem. We just, it's just as a commercial grower, we tend to do the quickest, fastest with the highest success rate. Um, and so that is, but you can definitely try direct seeding sweet peas. And yes, I have done it in years past. Um, and we can't get them past about this tall without somebody just munching them down. Um, and we just don't have a problem with that when we plant these guys out, probably the end of this week, maybe, or the first of next week, they'll be about 10 or 12 inches tall. And they're just, I guess, past that stage. All right, I'm looking. Lizianthus, Ruth. Lizianthus zone 6B fall planting. Lizianthus, I am told, um, in fact, and by people that I know that they know what they're, you know, they're experienced growers, that Lizianthus is really winter hardy to probably zone five. However, what takes Lizianthus out, which can also take out any cool flower, is wet feet. Whenever you plant anything in the fall to go through winter, even parts of your garden or farm that you feel like is well-drained is maybe not so well-drained in the winter because the temperatures are not high. It's not drying the soil out. We get more rain and snow and ice. Um, just like you saw that water standing out there. If this was a summer day and that rain had happened this afternoon, it'd be gone by now. Um, and so, um, Lizianthus are predisposed 
to root diseases, um, as many hardy annuals are. Um, I'm not sure if they're more predisposed or if that if that recipe to provide the, the perfect conditions for those diseases is in fall and winter. So anything you plant in the fall or winter is, you know, pre can really be more susceptible to that. Um, so I would say yes, but you just have to really be sure to give them excellent drainage. Um, when, when um, I can't remember her name. Laurie, I did. Laura Hodges. She's in Nebraska. She actually told me she thought they were hardy. She, um, she's an ag person, a hardy to zone four. Um, but she said it's wet feet that take them out every time. All right. I'm planning to direct, side my, direct seed mine too. Did you soak your sweet peas before direct sowing? Um, we did not. We have soaked, but we did not soak these. Lisa, can status, straw flower, craspedia, and scabiosis grown this year be cut low, thickly mulched to hold over for next year? You know, the, the million dollar question is, you know, if they bloomed and performed this year, they may have already like spent their gas money um, and they probably look really, really good right now. And you, if you have the room and the back to take care of them, and you don't need that room to plant more. I would not rely on them is what I should probably say to you. I would not rely on them to produce for you for next year. I would plant more and do them as an experiment and find out. Um, but they're called annuals because they typically only last a year. Many of the annuals will reseed themselves and people tend to think they come back. Take for instance, Rudbeckia Indian Summer. Um, Rudbeckia Indian Summer, um, I think it was NC State did a, a trial and um, it's not one of the perennial rudbeckias. And you can leave, they're gorgeous at the end of fall. And you think, oh my gosh, I can't take them out. But what they found is less than 20% of them survive the winter. And then what happens? Then you have a bed that has spotty rudbeckia all over it. That is fine if you're a home gardener. But if you are a commercial grower, you, that, you, you have to let all that stuff go. Um, we talk about that so much in flower farming school. That's one of the things where we talk about taking off your gardener glasses and putting on your farmer glasses, your business, that changes everything. Um, and you can't rely on that kind of stuff. But if I was a home gardener or a very small grower, um, you know, you can try it, but don't be disappointed. Michelle can't wait to start school. I am really excited about school too. Um, and I'll start watching the course. I'll, I rewatch the weeks that y'all are watching during the week that you're watching them, so I'm prepared. Um, even though this is my fourth class or year, you know, school year, and it's just very exciting. Also, do I cut back foxglove that did not bloom this year? I grew them from seed. So, um, the foxglove that we recommended growing in Cool Flowers was the variety Foxy, and the reason that was is that Foxy goes from seed to bloom in 16 weeks. That is not the case with almost all others. Not all others, most others. Um, they are what are we would call a biennial. They need a longer um, growing period and vernalization, which is a cold treatment. And so if you plant, if you started them and planted them this year, 2021, and they did not bloom, um, yes, they will probably bloom this coming spring, we hope, right? Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't cut them back. I wouldn't cut the foliage back. I would just leave them be, I think. How long is the peony row and how many plants is that to get a thousand blooms? Well, Tina, what you have to know is all of those plants were my grandmother's and my cousin's mother's. Um, the roots are enormous. Um, and as Dave and I have talked about numerous times, I've probably got enough peony roots in that one row to plant an entire acre of peonies if I wanted them, which I don't. Um, and so there, there's really no way for you to, to figure that out. Um, I don't know how many plants it is. We actually transplanted them there two years ago. Um, but that row is about 90 feet long. And there's two rows of plants that are 12 inches apart and they're zigzagged like this. So there's two rows and they're staggered um, and they're amazing. I mean, we were so surprised last year to get such a bumper crop of blooms um, based on the fact that we had moved them. But when we moved them, we followed Dave's advice. 
We did not cut the foliage back that year. The foliage is what feeds the roots. That's why you wait until it's totally dead. Um, but we moved them earlier in the fall. He had me not cut the foliage back, um, and we didn't break up the clumps. I mean, we didn't divide them. We just picked them up. We dug them and lifted them, and literally me and Bobo and Rhonda um, ran them from where they were to back to there and just planted them immediately, and they've done really, really well. Karen, do you have status reseeding at all? Because I have a commercial garden that gets kind of torn down and recover cropped and all that, we don't see as much reseeding. Um, I don't think I have seen a lot of stuff reseed, but I don't know that I've ever had status reseed. Does anybody else have trouble starting snaps? Mine look like the end of a toothpick. So if your seed haul didn't let go of the little stem that pops up, first off, they will sprout from the base. Trust me, I've got some sitting right outside. And it's because of the moisture level. We found that laying that wide weave burlap over our um, soil blocks really helps to trap more moisture on the surface. Um, but that's what it's really all about. It's just a lack of moisture on the surface. And because the seeds are sown on the surface, um, they're very predisposed to that. And I have definitely found some varieties are worse at doing that than others. Um, Rocket is doesn't do it as much as Madam Butterfly can. Um, Opus doesn't. Um, but, it, but it's all about the moisture level because, I mean, it's so funny that we always start like for instance, our Snapdragon mixes the dragons. Um, we always start those twice um, because I always need to have enough. We're always trying to get more photography, right? So we started them early and I had some of that happen. Um, and it just didn't, I just did not have a good, we had some kind of mechanical breakdown here and um, it, it just wasn't the best germination ever, right? So we restart one, three to four weeks later, same seed pack, same everything, except the temperatures are a little bit cooler, and we were more attentive to laying the burlap, and guess what? We had like 100% germination, so we have a ton of snaps of um, dragons out in the garden, thank goodness. Um, so anyway, so most often, well not most often, 99% of the time, y'all, because I, we get, we, I see all kinds of stuff. People tend to want to blame that they got bad seeds or um, is it the soil or is it something else you're doing? 99% of the time, it is operator error, meaning it's not the right temperature, it's not the right moisture level, it's not something. Because how many times, and I mean, I'm 24 years in and still screwing it up. So it happens. Um, and you just, that's why we always plan on starting twice. Um, everything. Um, we just restarted a new Rudbeckia that we're adding to our lineup. It's called um, Sunset Cherokee, I think, or Cherokee Sunset. And the first germination um, wasn't so hot. Well, it turns out that the seeds got pushed too deep in the soil block because the person sowing it didn't realize that they can go right, that they should go right on the surface. Things happen. So we always have enough seed that we can start two rounds. So if that first one is not spectacular, we can start more. You inspired me to plant sunflowers in August this year. I lost about 40% of them to bugs. Any suggestions? Well, it would really depend on what bugs you're talking about. But I find in general, um, so we don't really have a lot of pest damage and that's because we have just really worked really hard to what I call restoring the natural order of our farm. And that means we use zero pesticides, not even um, organic pesticides. Um, my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, which is about a three season cutting garden, y'all, is about the way that I farm and garden and about how nature provides all the heavy lifting, but we've been so busy eliminating it as well as try, while we're trying to eliminate the bad bugs, we've really broken the system big time. Um, and we just really don't have a problem. This time of the year, the problem that I have is some there's grasshoppers, but they are not out of control. We hand pick them. Um, but it would really depend on what your pressure is and then also your selection of sunflowers. If you're having a lot of 
pest damage or pest pressure, I would recommend that you grow the Pro Cut Orange, which is the hardiest of all of them. It does vary from colors. Um, don't even think about growing the white ones or the light yellow ones. They show pest damage really quickly, and you may be harvesting them too late. Remember, the stage to harvest is like this. Before the petals just so the, when I cut this yesterday, these petals were flat on this face, and they'll quickly open up inside. But inside, guess what? There's no grasshoppers, no cucumber beetles, um, no, no pests just tearing them up. Um, so oftentimes, pest damage can be prevented by the stage in which you um, harvest in. But I would definitely recommend that you check out that book. Tina, cannot wait either, enrolled in your class. It's gonna really be a great class because you know, I think there's a lot of people that I've been connected to for a really long time. Um, and so now it'll just be, it'll be really fun. And we have this great new format for our question and answer coaching time. Um, so I just can't wait to um, jump in with you guys and help you find your way. Karen, I still struggle with wink necks on the white light, yep, and red pro cuts. Using a hydrating solution, any recommendations? So yes, um, and what you're experiencing is perfectly normal. Any of, not just pro cuts, any sun cloud, sunflower with what I call the fancy colors, the colors that are not just classic sunflower colors, which means I guess they've had a lot of breeding maybe. Um, they have soft necks. And so... Glad you asked that, somewhere right here. Quick dip. And so quick dip, and you can find this on our website too if you need it. Um, I literally, and this is not very technical, y'all. Um, I literally put a splash into the harvest bucket before I take it out there. And I would guess it's a couple tablespoons. Um, this is a hydrator, um, but it's supposed to be that you just dip the stems in them um, and then take them right out. But I learned from a very um, wise flower arranger here that used to buy a lot of flowers from me. She said, I just put quick dip in all my buckets. Because she mostly bought, bought shipped in flowers, right? Trying to get them to drink. Um, so, a couple of things. I put quick dip in the buckets for all of the sunflowers that are of that nature. You know, those fancy colors. And that would even be the bi colors fall under that. White also. The next thing is, is that I only leave one leaf, and literally, if that one was chewed off, um, I literally, I mean, I only leave one leaf on all of those bouncy neck sunflowers, um, and because really anything below here, you don't need anyway, but that really affects it. Um, be sure you're cutting them at the proper stage, pretty tight, um, and I also like to stand them up in narrow, tall buckets so that there's none of this flopping business. Um, but really, the reality is here for us in making mixed bouquets for, you know, supermarkets and um, our members market, the girls that are making the bouquets have found when they know they have white ones, they always put the white sunflowers in the middle of the bouquet so they're supported by the flowers around them. Um, there's a lot of things to do, but stage of harvest, um, stripping and using a little quick dip might help you a whole lot because that's one thing that kept me from growing um, white ones for so long because their necks were so dadgum soft. But I'm going to tell you, our commercial customers would buy them every week knowing that they had soft necks because of the flower. They just figured out ways around it. I'm obsessed in a new grower down the road, run by your farm and gush all the time. Hi, Megan. Well, I mean, if we can ever get rid of this coronavirus business, um, I mean, I just hope and pray we can have an open farm next June. Typically, our open farm is the last Saturday in June. That's like a really cool flowers is still going. Summer's kind of really getting going. Um, but it's just too crazy, and um, we'll see what happens. What do you currently have row covers on? Do you uncover during the day and recover at night? So we, if this is early for us to have row covers out, but we put them out when that wind storm came a week or two or whenever it was. And um, so we typically don't like to put the row covers out until we've mulched the pathways. The pathways don't get mulched until the leaves fall and the leaves are just now starting to fall. I literally saw several bags today 
But I mean, we usually don't go out until we can get 100 bags or, you know, 50 bags or something. So row covers are out and it's because we had just planted and a windstorm came and I knew that they would just wind whip my seedlings to death. So we put them up, we put them up for that event. Um, they're back down. I mean, they don't go up for winter until we're 25, 28 degrees um, and take them off when snow is coming. Um, and we use row cover not for cold protection, but for wind and varmint protection and to protect the foliage um, that is so that our plants will be just in much better shape. I mean, let's just think about it. So, yeah, you could push your kid out the door to go to the bus stop on a 55 degree day and they're going to survive. They're not going to be very happy about it, though, and you're probably going to listen to them bellyache for a while. Well, same thing with your plants. You know, you can put up, they're all cold winter hardy, but it's the winter wind and frost and everything else right on the foliage. Just having that layer like a little overcoat on makes all the difference in the world. Um, I have enough row cover and I will tell you, we're already getting the calls um, at the Gardener's Workshop Fulfillment Center um, of people that didn't plan far enough ahead and then all of a sudden you're getting a forecast of, you know, you're getting cold, cold and you don't have enough row covers, y'all plan ahead. I have enough row cover to cover my entire farm. I mean, all the garden space. I never would need it that way, but it also allows me that if we're gonna have some crazy event where it's gonna drop down much colder than we're normally gonna be for over two or three days, which really means that really affects the plants, then I can double cover certain beds that I feel are susceptible. Um, don't get caught. I mean, it's like doing planting cool flowers and not having the cool flower tools it is really crazy. So row cover, hoops, and bags. Most people don't have enough weights. We never have enough weights, but you have to have enough weights, y'all. I have almost enough now um, because if you can't keep the covers down, when you put the weights on the way that's on, if you go to thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the row cover product page, there's videos there on a video tab and you can see how I put it down and if you know I put three weight bags on each end I live in a really windy site you know for winter we have 20 25 mile an hour winds just constantly moving across our garden and if I don't put three on the end and a weight bag on each side at the foot of each hoop the hoop the row cover comes up you got to prevent air from getting caught um, so the story with row covers is you just get better at it. Years of catastrophes, you know, you only have to have your row covers get caught in the power lines once to learn about how many weights you need to have. I had them over winter in 6B, but then the spring thaw off and took them out quickly. I have drainage tile under the section where they were planted. I wonder if she's talking about Lysianthus. All right, friends, what time is it? Almost time to get off. So I so glad I found the Gardeners Workshop. Well, thank you, Deb. We're glad you did, too. Listening in from South Carolina, Flower Farm on vacation. Lisa, I know you said you cover your pathways with leaves. What do you suggest I do if my beds, with my beds if I do not cover crop or use fabric or plastic? Cover your pathways with leaves. What do you suggest I do with my beds if I do not cover crop or use? So if you're talking about the top of the bed, um, I mean, before I started using the biodegradable, I mean, we don't use plastic either or landscape fabric on beds. Um, that's a biodegradable film. It's called Bio360. You can learn more about it on our website in the store. We have it there. Um, but before I started using that, we mulched. I mean, we used anything, chopped up leaves, straw, um, I mean, bark is just too labor intensive and they want you to pay for it. Um, but you have to put something down or you're gonna have, I mean, you don't have to, you can cultivate all the time. Um, but yeah, so mulching is the key. You've gotta block the light from getting to the soil surface on top. That's what germinates all the weed seeds. Charlotte, do I still keep them on the heat mat and then light? I'm not sure what you're asking about. Charlotte, I'm sorry. Well, there's Wanda. I thought you were on vacation. Um, 
A mature peony, eight plus years plant, will usually produce at least 15 to 20 blooms. Wanda is a professional peony grower in Alaska, who I think is currently sinking her, her tooties in the sand in either Georgia or Florida or somewhere. So you need about 50 mature plants to get a thousand blooms. And that's probably pretty fair. And ours are ancient um, and super healthy. I was, Wanda, I was so proud when, when Dave was here. I was kind of nervous him looking at him. Um, and we're healthy and good. I mean, we literally, other than throwing fertilizer and some compost on them from time to time, do you use Quick Dip and CVB tablets together? That's a great question, Tina. I do use CVB tablets in all of our buckets. That's the chlorine tablet. You can find that on our website too if you need to learn more about it because um, sunflowers are definitely what we call a member of the dirty dozen. They pollute the water. Um, and yes, so I use both. You're welcome for the quick tip. You know, I will, I will still remember when Lee told me that, you know, this is like an old school flower arranger. She just does gorgeous big work, you know, and I was belly, she was over here picking out flowers. This was years ago. And I was talking about, she said, what's wrong with that bucket over there? And it was a bunch of Rudbeckia, Indian summer. Sometimes they just, right? And so I had set it back away where nobody would take any of them. And she said, what's wrong with them? I said, oh yeah, they're all wilted. She said, well, you got some quick dip? Just I said, well, I did dip them. She said, dip them, nothing. Put it in the bucket. And then she told me it was great. And we've definitely done it and it works. I put row covers on the direct zone to keep the cat from scratching them up. Yeah, I mean, we had disturbance in the back. I mean, we have all kinds of varmints doing it. You can, when you direct sow, you can put row cover flat on the ground right on top of the bed. That helps to retain moisture and it keeps varmints from taking your seeds today. Wait, you don't cover for the first frost? Won't the tiny plants get frostbite? No, Courtney. So I don't know if you've read my book, Cool Flowers. The concept is that when flowers are winter hardy, which it tells you in the book and also on my website on the seed list, if it's winter hardy in your winter hardiness zone, it does not need frost protection. The cover protection protects the life of the plant you know, the health of the plant, you might say, or the conditions, but it's not required. It's only, and I don't do this, if you planted something, if you're in zone five, let's just say, that's north, if you're in zone five and you planted something that was really only winter hardy to zone seven, that meant you are growing something that normally would not survive in your cold winter. That would need some kind of help. So no, you do not. And I really recommend... Um, that people grow within their winter hardiness zone until you really get a handle on what you're doing and how you're doing it. Yeah, darn cats. When do you take vacation? Um, well, I take vacations from time to time. I typically don't take long vacations because I have a dog who usually goes with us. Um, but you just... <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep question. Depends on where you are in your business. Um, if you're just starting out, it's really hard to leave until you've got a team that supports you now. I could get hit by a bus tomorrow and my people could go on without me because they're so wonderful. Um, Southern California. Oh, Northern Alberta, Tracy. So Tracy is in zone 2B. And so Tracy is where... It's pretty dead gum cold. Short growing season. She can really make the most out of cool flowers because she can plant them. She wouldn't fall plant them, but she can plant them much earlier in spring, which for her, I would guess is June. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of growers up in Alberta um, practicing cool flowers. Rhode Island. So I have lots of students on here. So everybody, it's time for us to, um, so Charlotte, you were asking about snaps. Um, you're so welcome, everybody. Yeah, a lot of people's last markets are tomorrow, you know, the end of October. So I wish everybody the best. Don't forget to request the cool flower um, 
PDF that has all the different links that's at the head here. Um, and Charlotte, I'm not sure what you were asking, but I'll try to go back through, me or Rhonda or somebody will, and see if we can't see what you're asking about your Snapdragons. Um, and so all my students, just be ready. The first week is like the worst part. It's the business. We're going to talk about hard stuff and get that mess out of the way so then we can dive into building gardens and figuring out what to grow and who to sell it to and how to get them, meet them, find them, get selling to them, um, and lots of fun, fun stuff. Um, and just wait until you get to class four and see our new tool. So Y'all are um, not going to believe it. What can I use? Oh, Rebecca's asked, can I use wheat straw in your pathways? You can use anything um, in your pathways. The question is, is you got to put it deep enough for it to really work. With straw, I would think a minimum of 12 to 15 inches because it compacts really quick. That's a lot of straw. Um, so, yeah, you can certainly do that. All right, friends. I am... Um, so I'll answer this one, then I gotta go. Jeanette, do you harden off your plants that are sown indoors? If so, how long? Um, for cool flowers, not very long because we are, flat plants are much more susceptible to heat than they are to cool cold, especially when they're cold, cool season hardy annuals. Um, so we typically put them out here on the carport for maybe three to seven days. It just depends on our planting schedule. Um, and putting them out in the field, but also it just depends on the conditions out there. This time of year, overcast, raining, cool temps, I have no problem moving them out there quickly. But if it's still hot, we'll wait a little while longer. Um, warm season tender annuals, like spring and summer stuff, at least seven to 10 days, because they really need to get acclimated. Um, I'm just looking at my list. So I'm just waiting for some darn leaves, y'all. Um, and so friends, till we meet again, remember, so school starts Tuesday. I'll still meet you here next Friday. Actually, I wasn't going to, but I see that Jesse, who is one of our team members, who was also one of our students, who is now a part of our team at the Gardener's Workshop, she's in Kansas, um, scheduled the next few Fridays. So I guess I'm showing up, but we can do it. Um, and so friends, Check out, I can see you on Instagram on Wednesdays at 11.30, Clubhouse at 1 o'clock. Um, we have two new courses, not new, two courses that are enrolling in the next two weeks, three weeks. Um, Ellen Frost and Stephen Gretel Adams. If you're a flower farmer, you want to check out both of them. Um, Ellen's course is amazing, and if you have green or hoop houses or aspire into, you can't miss. Both of them only open up once a year for enrollment, so we'd love to welcome you into our family. And um, all right, friends, I can't wait to see y'all in school on my Tuesday. Um, until we meet again, friends, ciao.